Technical Masters is rolling out here shortly, and I wanted to talk about the top 10 cards that you might want to keep an eye on from this set. Make sure you guys smash the living crap out of that subscribe button so you guys don't miss out on more awesome content. Number one on our list here is going to be none other than Runic Destruction. Now you're probably like, wait, we're, we're just going to start off with Runic cards? Yeah. So... I don't know how many of you guys know this, but there were some very like early Eldritch lists in Japan out of last format that were kind of taking advantage of some of the very niche interactions with some of the runic cards, because they basically force mill the opponent's deck in addition to having some sort of effect. Yeah, you lose a battle phase of your next battle phase, but that's fine, right? So this one's special abilities, target a spell or trap card your opponent controls, destroy it. Okay, well, spell and trap popping is not the greatest thing in the world, but I mean, these are going to be very low rarity um, and easy pickups. Then your additional effect is your opponent banishes the top five cards, or excuse me, the top four cards of their deck. Okay. If you want to play some of the runic cards to chum block from your extra deck, all the runic cards also include my favorite clause of special summon a runic monster from your extra deck to the extra monster zone. Free chum block. Now, this is where things start to get interesting. We have Flashing Fire. Like all the runic cards, this one also has the skip a battle phase. Oh, no. Anyway... Target one special summon monster your opponent controls, destroy it, then your ban opponent banishes the top two of their deck. Now, here's the thing once again. This isn't as great as the Spell and Trap Popper, which banishes four, but once again, you have a quick play pop ability built in to a quick play spell card. Once again, available in lower rarity. Now, if you're looking at potential penny stonks within the set, even if these fail, I mean, picking up two to three play sets of things to have. You know, if you want to play Eldritch and possibly try out some of the OCG concepts for these, um, Flashing Fire was one of the ones. Destruction, I didn't see have a lot of play. If you're also trying to focus on the Runic deck excel or itself, you know, in terms of being a mill out deck, this is one of the option trees you're going to need. Speaking of the second good one here, Freezing Curses. Like every other Runic card here, we have Skip Your Next Battle Phase After Activation. Now remember, you have to force go into your battle phase for that to really matter, all right? If not, they're going to just keep stacking, and you're going to never get a battle phase. But it's so, okay. So target one effect monster your opponent controls, negate its effects until the end of this turn, and then banish the top three cards of your deck. Now, who doesn't like a fiendish chain built in on a quick play spell card? Uh, my favorite thing about this thing is it's acting as a pseudo effect veiler under the field spell, which we'll talk more about fountain here in a little bit, but specific targeting negation, fine. And like every other gosh darn runic card, it also gives you the ability to chum block from the extra deck as well. So freezing curses and flashing fire are literally the two best ones, in my opinion, for single utility. Now, we also have a runic tip here. Now, like every other runic card, you skip your battle phase. Now, the thing that makes this card particularly interesting is it adds one runic card from your deck to your hand, except for tip, and then you banish the top card of your opponent's deck. Yes, this only spot removals one off the deck, but that doesn't immediately matter because you have a searcher. This is your rota for the archetype. Now, if you're planning on playing like the full package of the deck, you're going to need to buy three of these anyway which is kind of a little bit expensive as of this point, but I don't see much of a problem with this, all right? When you build the Rota with such a high value um, built into it, okay. And you also have the ability to chum block with this if you really need to. If you have to chum block with your searcher, uh, you're gonna run into some more immediate problems in terms of things, but sometimes, it is just like that. So, I love the fact the whole first half of this video is all going to be runic cards. Next up is the Fountain. Oh my god, I love this card. You can activate runic quick play spell cards from your hand during your opponent's turn. Now, if your opponent has an out to this, um, it's really going to suck for you. Like, that, that's your big trade-off. Like, your field spell is the thing that does everything. But you still got to think about these cards in single, like uses. And then once per turn, if you activate a runic quick play spell card, you can target up to three runic quick play spell cards in your graveyard, place them on the bottom of your deck in any order, and then draw the same. This is the famous field spell that gives you a draw three on each player's turn. And I know a lot of players look at this and they're like, wow, you know, 
a draw three, like that's very impressive. Yeah, especially when spell and trap card hate um, exists within a format as at an all time low, you can definitely creep in some pretty crazy power plays just with this card existing within the realm of the format. So that's definitely something to watch. Ah, uh, yes. Next up here is going to be Trap Trick, but the reason why I'm mentioning this is going to be the Collector's Rare. Now, the reason why I mentioned the Collector's Rare for this is this is kind of a wild card of the set. Um, when I look at Trap Trick as a card, we've seen like the secret first that's be worth usually the most when it comes to these things. Now, when they do something like this, where they bring in a higher rarity, for example, it's not an ultimate rare, but to what price point will these go? I do have a feeling that this will have a very high demand for it, because right now, considering the fact that this basically becomes any trap card in your deck, that's a normal. So you can play three Deck Devastation Virus, three of this, congratulations, you're now playing six copies of Deck Devastation Virus. Is this a trouble card? No. Most players only play one to two of this to kind of expand out their trap lineup, but there will be a very high demand, I think, for this once this set gets older within its life. So pick these up relatively early. Now, next up is Astrograph Sorcerer. <sighs> Is Electromite coming back, Robbie? Is that why you're telling us to pick this up? No. I think that having a Collector's Rare show up within the market like this that could have the potential to go up over time um, is very, very good. I think a lot of people are going to look at this in every ban list. They're going to go, we got to buy out Astrograph Sorcerer, guys. It, it's going to be a pretty big headache at the end. But I think in the very early stages, this card's going to come out. We're going to go through a ban list. Electromite's not going to come back. And then you'll see this card probably plummet in price. And at that point, that'd be the opportunity that I would want to grab a copy of this to have. But right now, it doesn't really see much of a play within the current Pendulum engine itself. But once again, players always ask, hey, you know, what's something I can keep an eye on? Keep an eye on Collector's Rare Astrograph Sorcerer, and we can see where this card ends up going in terms of the market, potentially as a late-term pickup. <sighs> Rare Anti-Spell Fragrances and the Collector's Rares. Uh, Penny Stonks, ladies and gentlemen, that's the name of this set in terms of certain rares. Sure, you know, if you can open up a box, pull 8, 9, an upteen amount of Anti-Spell Fragrances, keep them, you know, half a year down the line, ah, boom, all of a sudden the card's worth money. I think both versions of this card are going to be warranted watching in the set because Penny stonks. <laughs> All right. I love good reprints like this. The only thing that made people upset with this was this pretty much confirms the fact that we're not going to be getting this card banned anytime soon, which means people are always going to continue to be upset. But in terms of collector's rare value, I'm definitely curious to see the long-term implications of this. You know, like how, how well can we hold down within the market, you know, how how far can this card go in terms of value? I think it's Rivalry 2.0 where it'll be kind of quiet on release and then shoot up. The other best penny stong in the set, of course, is Droll and Lockbird. Man, oh man. Every Droll and Lockbird for most of its life has been $10 plus. And Konami just looked at the set and went, oh, okay, we're just going to mass drop all these rare Droll and Lockbirds here. Is it a hollow printing? No. It is the same rarity as its original counterpart from Star Strike Blast. So once again, a lot of people are going to be looking at this immediately going, oh, no, like, the loss of value. No, this card in a couple of months will be worth it. And then, of course, the Collector's Rare, I know a few people look at it as conflicting with the Ultimate Rare, but I think that's fine. I don't see any sort of, like, crazy rhyme or reason that people are kind of losing their mind, particularly over this. Um, a little bit crazy to me, sure, but... Hey man, the collector's rares and the ultimate rares, I still think the ultimate will be worth more in the long run, but people like to uh, disagree. So we'll, we'll see where that goes overall. And the last one I want to mention here is Lovely Labyrinth of the Silver Castle. This is uh, one of your many components to the waifu tax of this set. Now, this is basically the centralized card of the theme. Um, the reason why I bring this up is I think both versions, Ultra Rare and Collector's Rare, will probably be a little bit expensive. I, I hope to be proven wrong on that front to some degree because I would like to see the Labyrinth deck be relatively affordable. That'd be really nice, but this is definitely going to be one of those cards I'm going to keep an eye on here, you know, especially through release here as you're like, oh, like I want to pick up this deck or want to be able to play this. We'll have to wait and see, ladies and gentlemen. So those are your top 10 cards out of the 
interesting, interesting future set here. I uh, hope you guys found Tactical Masters to be quite an interesting set in terms of value, but please, leave a comment down below, tell me what you guys think, make sure you guys smash the little crap out of that subscribe button, see your beautiful faces back here later in the day, guys. Peace out. Patrons, thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Check out these other videos.